to have Dr. Julie Lowndes and Dr. Marcus Beck here today to talk to us about um, open science, both kind of in a more global context as well as in a local context here in the Tampa Bay area. So Dr. Julie Lowndes um, works at NCES, which is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which is based at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, she worked on the Ocean Health Index project where she developed a lot of her open science skills. Um, and she is the founder of OpenScapes, um, which helps kind of teach people about uh, how to apply oceans, uh, open science uh, in their own research. And then we also have Dr. Marcus Beck. Um, he is a scientist at the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and he is in charge of their Open Science Subcommittee and has been working on really making their reporting process more transparent and bringing it into an open science framework. And I'm not going to spoil too much about that. I'm going to let them uh, tell you uh, about how they're doing those things. So you guys can start up now. So yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Marcus. Uh, I will be uh, first talking about my experience with uh, Open Science, the Tampa Bay SUA program. And then uh, Julie will be following me and talking about actually some of the specific tools you can use to use Open Science on your own and run with it. So um, this seminar is all about open science. I hope you uh, learned some things and, and are excited about this as we are. Um, my talk is going to be Tampa Bay specific. Okay. Um, first, going to uh, talk to you about the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, just so you can kind of understand a little bit about who we are, um, what we're trying to do, our history. And then I'm going to talk about some of our approaches towards uh, adopting a more open science workflow so uh, we can, as the title implies, do better science in less time. And then I'll end with some closing thoughts about how we are really trying to facilitate open science in the region because this is very much a uh, community-based effort. So I think a lot of people on the line now are, are familiar with Tampa Bay and its story. Uh, you guys are, are regional here, so hopefully you're up to date on what has happened. But uh, a long time ago, um, well, maybe not for some, but for me, a long time ago, uh, Tampa Bay was not a, a very nice place to be. Um, it's certainly not like the way it is now. Um, I'd say around the 60s and 70s and even in the 80s, um, there was really just um, a lot of uh, pollution in the Bay that contributed to um, hypereutrophic conditions, a lot of nutrient pollution, and uh, was actually declared dead at some point uh, by the popular press. Uh, and this, of course, was, was seen as a problem. Um, you know, this is a focal area for people to live here. And of course, you know, we, we wanted to see it uh, improve so that we can enjoy it as a resource, not just uh, recreationally, but, but what it provides for us economically and culturally. Um, so the good news is, you know, there's a lot to this story, but the good news is that it is now presently considered an environmental success story uh, among um, uh, the coastal realm, if you will. Uh, and so what this means is essentially uh, around 2015, 2016, the uh, seagrass coverages in Tampa Bay uh, actually exceeded the target goal uh, going back to a 1950s benchmark condition before we knew uh, when the bay was impacted by pollution. So we have uh, right now we're actually around 40,000 acres of seagrasses in the bay. And this, of course, was accomplished through uh, reductions in nutrient loads that have happened over time over the last three decades or so. Uh, less nutrients means less algae in the water column, less shading, and of course the seagrasses would, would return as a result. So this is a great thing. Um, this is, again, a great success story that we like to tell um, and that we sort of um, discuss as a program in terms of how we understand the history of the Bay. Um, I started working for the Tampa Bay Estuary Program uh, in November of 2019, so I'm still very much new uh, to the area. 
Um, but my understanding about uh, TBEP or TBEP is that uh, they've actually done a lot. Uh, they've been key facilitators in this process of improving the uh, condition of the Bay. Uh, we're a smallish organization. We have seven employees, including myself, but we actually we facilitate and we, we uh, promote and foster partnerships among our member agencies that it can actually do uh, some activities on the ground to improve uh, the environmental quality of the Bay. Uh, so we are part of the NEP, the National Estuary Program, which is uh, established under Clean Water Funds, uh, Clean Water Act funds through the EPA. Uh, we were established in 1991. And in 1998, we went under an interlocal agreement, which basically made us kind of a, a quasi special district states or special uh, district uh, part of the state of Florida. And this sort of gave us an ability to leverage resources, not just federally, but from our local partners as well. Where we, we kind of collaboratively agreed that we're going to work together and pool our resources to agree that we all need to work together to protect the Bay. And our broader mission is to develop these partnerships and sort of serve as a key facilitator to implement a science-based management and restoration plan for the Tampa Bay Estuary. Um, as I said, we, we literally, uh, TDEP, we're a small organization, but we work with a large group of individuals. Uh, this is our governance structure. Um, we have a policy board, a management board, we have community advisory committees, technical advisory committees, and we have partners from local uh, city governments, regional governments that, that are part of our interlocal agreement. So um, we have, we're in a position to affect how people think about the Bay um, in a uh, public education perspective, but it can also inform how the Bay is managed uh, by those that can actually um, control the nutrient pollution, for example. And so we try to facilitate all sorts of activities and actions among uh, everybody that's part of our governing structure. And so this is where open science comes into the equation. Um, TBEP has been a really effective organization over the last 30 years, but say in the last five, 10 years or so, I think this is sort of a common scenario that many institutions are finding out now is that we're just inundated with information. Uh, we're resource limited, we're a small team, and we need to do science in a better way so we can communicate uh, information to our partners so they can actually make meaningful impacts in what they do. And so I was hired in 2019 to sort of try to do this. Um, you know, we try to operationalize a lot of our workflows for our reporting on health of the Bay and what that means for the information uh, that can be ingested by our partners. And so I always try to um, discuss open science in terms of a cake. Um, one, because everybody likes cake. And two, it actually is a pretty appropriate, a pretty appropriate metaphor for open science. Um, and the cake is, it's a spectrum. Uh, it's a gradient of layers where on the top, you might have the public, for example. In the middle, you might have managers or uh, elected officials that can actually um, uh, make decisions to affect the environment. And then at the bottom, you have the research community, the science that forms the foundation of the cake. So at the top of the cake, this is more general information that's more actionable, uh, that sort of distills uh, science in a way that, that can promote change. But of course, this top of the cake wouldn't exist without the foundation. So at the very bottom, uh, with the research community, this is more specific information that is the foundation of everything on top. And so science is the foundation, but we want to meet our audience at different levels where they're at. Uh, and this is where open science can really help with that. So we can take the research foundation and serve it up in different ways that makes it more accessible to our audiences. We can make interactive dashboards that sort of immerse people in the data. We can make report cards for distilling information for action. We can develop all sorts of decision support tools or prioritization tools. Um, we can make educational materials, fact sheets that are all based on a solid um, scientific foundation. And so that, again, is how we are trying to think about open science and what it means for the delivery of, of research to inform decision making and uh, the public understanding of, of this environmental resource. So as an example, um, you know, we, we report on many different things relevant to the Bay Health uh, and these products require 
a lot of data and information that is produced by our partners. And it's our job to take that information and again, use that solid scientific foundation, distill in a way that's easily digestible and can be used to make an informed decision. Uh, one really good example of this is our water quality report card. Uh, this is something that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but every year we put this out to basically provide a nice graphic and summary of how we did that year for uh, water quality in the Bay. Uh, it's pretty high level, it's, it's two page PDF, and it distills a lot of data from, from our uh, partners, in particular Hillsborough County EPC that collects this information. So this is a great product. Uh, that we've been producing for a couple of years, but it is uh, what I like to call an applied science bottleneck. Um, so this was something that was produced every year. Um, you know, the, the product itself was a great way to distill this information, but the process behind it was kind of closed, insular, only um, known by one person on the team. Uh, so it relies on institutional knowledge. The actual process behind it from distilling the data and producing the summary graphics was opaque, known only to that one person that made the product. Um, and this was costly, uh, not just in time, but the resources required to produce it. And the entire process was um, pretty much done manually uh, in a way that uh, is maybe sort of prone to error uh, because things are done by hand or it's just inefficient as a result. So open science was our attempt to try to improve on this workflow as one example, as a proof of concept that we could apply to other reporting products. So this is the workflow expanded um, using a lot of different tools and now in a way that sort of exposes that underlying process. Um, the endpoints are the same, you know, we're still pulling in data from an external source. We're still producing that two page report, but how we do that in a way to increase efficiency of the process and expose the underlying methods is at the core of how we're trying to use open science to improve uh, how we do business. Um, so we're using open source toolkits now to produce this information. We're hosting the analysis code online in a way that's discoverable by others. Uh, it's produced using an automated workflow that, that minimizes the amount of intervention we have to use to actually um, uh, go forth and then produce it on our own. And uh, we're serving it up not just in this conventional two-pager report, but in different ways that, that provides a different level of experience for decision makers to consume this information. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the pieces of this and how this is done. Um, Julie's going to talk a little bit about that at a, in a more general context. but. I do want to emphasize one key component here is this, um, this code we have on GitHub, which is an online platform for sharing analysis software, essentially. And we've actually developed this, this R package. R is an analysis software program that's open source. Uh, and we've developed this specifically to um, expose the methods that are used to distill the information that go into our reports. So we sort of went into the old technical documents that said, this is how we're gonna summarize water quality, we put it into an open source coding environment, and now use it uh, in an automated fashion to produce these reports. So this TVAP tools package, we're actively developing this to do this for a lot of our reporting products, uh, not just the water quality report card. So it has tools to import data, estimate the data or estimate the indicators using the data that it's imported and then report the outcomes. And we do make it available online for anybody to use. Um, they can download the software, uh, run some code to get the results on their own, as well as see the underlying source code behind it if they really want to, to really dive in and see what's going on underneath the hood. And this is our workhorse for how we're just um, pulling in the data and synthesizing it for reporting. Uh, we have a couple key concepts behind this package in terms of what we wanted it to provide when we developed it. Um, we wanted uh, an emphasis on simplicity as the first concept here. Um, we, we wanted this to be easy to use if anybody could download this and pull in the data on their own and create the graphics. So in this example, I'm showing you basically, you know, there's like, three or four lines of code to install the package, but then you could run one line of code to create this summary graphic by importing the data from its source. And this is great because 
now we can use these functions to actually power some of the graphics behind our reporting documents. Uh, but if anybody wanted to say, make this graphic on our own, they can now do this easily with, with the package. We also want to emphasize currency, and I mean currency of information, uh, uh, timeliness of the data going into it. So we have data import functions that when you run the function, they go through this little, um, this decision tree where it checks first, do you have the data available on your computer? If not, it goes to the source to download the data and then you, know, you can proceed with the downstream analysis. However, when you run this function to import the data, if you already have it on your computer, it checks that current copy on your computer with the online source to see if it's the most current one. If not, it downloads the most recent one and proceeds as follows. Uh, if it is current, great, you go on your way. And so essentially every time you use these functions, you can ensure that you have the most up-to-date information. And it's handled all underneath the hood without having to do a lot of manual downloading from the source and you know, uh, unzipping compressed files, et cetera. We wanted to emphasize a workflow that's common in many analysis environments. So our functions are all named uh, based on sort of a general set of processes that they try to accomplish. So we have read functions that are all used to import data. And, and uh, actually on the right here, this is the current set of 12 functions that are in the package to import data for different purposes. So importing seagrass transect data, importing water quality data, importing benthic data, you name it. We have a set of functions to import those different data sets as they're meant to power some of our synthesis products. Uh, we have analysis functions named accordingly for distilling that information in a way that you can actually serve it up for plotting with our showing functions. And so this is, this is a mentality that a lot of packages try to adopt where the, the workflow should be logical and the functions should reflect that process of, of what they're trying to do. And then finally, we wanted to emphasize flexibility. So um, all of these functions that we have you know, the, the key decision points around how this information is communicated aren't set in stone. So we realize that things that affect, say, um, the categories that define a color bin are often informed by science, for example, but they often come down to, you know, a line in the sand that's chosen by um, decision makers. And so we want to throw this in there in the functions, not to say, let's cook the books by picking a different number, but have that as an option in there so you can play with the functions and see how these different decisions impact the outcomes or the plots you have uh, that are going to be affected by those decisions. And so that TBEP tools package is again the workhorse for a lot of our different reporting products. Um, and going back to this example about the report card, um, this workflow demonstrates in a little more detail how the TDAP tools package is integrated with some of these other open science tools to achieve this, this process of automating this report card or this generation of the report card. And so, um, as I said before, you know, we, we host all of these things online on GitHub. And there's these, these set of actions or tools that we can implement into a GitHub project. So we have our report card online on GitHub in a repository or a project. We basically set up this project to automate the build process for this report card. So literally every single day, this automated process will use the functions and TBEP tools to look at the online data that's provided by our partners, see if that data has changed in the last 24 hours. If it has, go through the process of completely rebuilding the report card so that it has the most current and up-to-date information that's feeding that. Um, and then what happens then is if it works, great. I see a little indicator here that says the build process worked. I, I can then know that this information is hosted online on our website uh, by tapping into what's on GitHub. And so what's on the website now is the most current version. Uh, but if it doesn't work, say uh, something goes wrong in the build process or the data has, has changed in a way that I can't, that this information can't be processed automatically, I get an email uh, that says, hey, something has gone wrong. You need to go and fix this. And so 
what this does is essentially free up my time where I only get involved in this process if something breaks. And we can define what breaks this process, whether it be the data are out of range or, or the data aren't in a format that we're expecting for the report card. So essentially we only get involved when we need to be. And so this frees me up for other activities uh, that, that you know, are part of my daily job. And so that's the value of this, this automated process. And so going back to this concept of the cake, um, you know, I, I, I presented this cake generally in the beginning about this, this metaphor of meeting people where they're at based on who they are and their needs for consuming this information that's informed by science. This is how we set up all of our reporting products on, on, our, on our website. So at the top, you know, maybe most people, were, they want to go to our website and view some very general information about a particular reporting product. However, if they want to dig a little deeper, they can do that. There's links on the right here that give them access to dashboards or other synthesis documents that are going to provide them with maybe actionable sources of information if they require that for their job. And then of course, at the bottom, you know, they can dig even deeper and there's links to uh, the technical documents that form the basis of the science or links to the actual source code that literally describe um, uh, a workflow for producing the synthesis documents. And so, again, we try to bring this, this workflow, this mentality to all of our reporting products so that they're all linked and anybody can engage with them depending on where their, their needs are for getting this information. So um, it's worth talking about some of the challenges we've had as an organization that aren't necessarily unique to us, but just some of the challenges for, for adopting open science in, in principle. So um, the learning curve for these tools are, of course, steep. Um, if you've taken a class on learning R or like other open source languages like Python, you know that it's not the easiest thing. So there's that hurdle. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit how we're trying to address that. But more importantly, like I said, we're a small team. And so we're always thinking about ways to um, make our workflows more efficient and how we can work more effectively, both internally and externally, because we're producing things for consumption by others. And so how we're doing that is essentially we're trying to really legitimize how we use open science as an organization. Uh, this is actually being implemented into our, our, um, our guiding documents, for example. So this is a, we just updated our strategic plan uh, from for the next five years and we actually have open science as a cornerstone approach uh, to how we are actually conducting science to inform decision making. We're actually trying to incentivize open science too. So uh, through some of our funding mechanisms, we're actually saying, if you wanna be a little more competitive when you request for funding from us, tell us how you're gonna bring open science to your project and how that's gonna you know, allow you to produce a product that's gonna be reused by others. Um, and we're actually, in addition to that, we're trying to create a space for learning uh, and attribution of products uh, that use open science and encouraging our partners to learn and adopt new tools. And we're doing this through um, essentially a subcommittee, which is our attempt at developing a community of practice in the region uh, to sort of normalize conversations around how open science is an excellent tool to help you do better science in less time. And so we actually uh, developed an open science subcommittee last year, which is nested within our TAC. Um, this is, of course, open to all, not just our TAC members, but uh, we are actually, uh, this subcommittee has, has three main roles. Um, they're meant to sort of review and vet the existing open science products that are being created by TDAP in our community so that it's not just say me, for example, developing a dashboard that I'm hoping others will use. So there's sort of a sounding board for that. Uh, we're using this subcommittee to rank priority research areas for developing open science products. So a lot of what I've been doing the last year is just taking existing technical products and opening the workflow behind them, but there's obviously new products that we need to be thinking about and we can use this community to, to um, understand those needs. And we're also using this community to fill, facilitate training activities around open science. And we've given a lot of our training events, for example. Uh, we're actually planning on doing additional open science workshops in the future to help further develop this community of practice. 
So what does this mean for our return on investment? I mean, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about open science, but the hope that it's going to uh, improve how we do business as an organization. And I think we are seeing already that return on, the, or on, that, on that investment. And so this is actually an example of um, something that happened earlier this week where this water quality report card that I was just talking about was picked up by Fox News and they reported on it. And uh, it was really cool to see that happen. The fact that uh, we were able to produce that in a way and actually have it serve its purpose and, and produce it in a way that is done using open science was to me just a huge win. And so I think that's great. Um, you know, people are recognizing these products and they're, they're serving their, their intended purpose. <clears throat> now, internally, uh, I think we're seeing returns as well. Um, so I'm going to pick on Gary for a second. Uh, Gary is our, our staff ecologist. Um, I asked him if it was appropriate to share this example. This is a, a, um, a chat log from Slack, which is an internal message service we use. Uh, and Gary is basically working with some of the open science products that I've created uh, in a way that I don't think would have happened prior to us using these tools. And so Gary is an ecologist, has an immense knowledge about the ecology of Tampa Bay that I don't have. I'm a data scientist. I have an immense knowledge about data science that Gary doesn't have, but yet we can work together using open science tools to uh, do better science in less time. And so this log basically is saying, okay, Gary had noticed a typo in the water quality report card. And I pointed them to the source document on GitHub that said, hey, this is where you need to make that change on GitHub. You can do it through their graphical user interface. You don't have to know anything about the coding. Just go in there and make the change. Gary says, I'll try it. I'll go in there. And I said, I hope it works. I'm giving a presentation about this soon. Uh, but then I said, hey, FYI, if it works, when you commit your edits, uh, you make those changes, the document should build automatically and everything should work as intended. A uh, couple of minutes go by, he made the changes, and then he says, oh, wow, it worked, that's great. Uh, and I, I commended him, I said, Gary, an open science fairy got its wings today. And this might seem like a trivial example, but to me, this is like integration of open science, cross collaboration incarnate. So like the fact that we can do this um, where we weren't at this place a year ago is, is an immense win for us. We are all working together, even if we don't all, you know, know how to use R or, or use GitHub, for example. So this is just one example of, of doing that. So I want to close with this quote um, that kind of speaks to the value of investing your time in open science. I've talked about the values it's had for us as an organization. Uh, but the whole point is to sort of let's all think together how we can collectively uh, use these, these uh, tools to affect change in how we protect this environment. And so uh, this is actually a quote about um, using R, for example, sort of best coding practices for R, but I think it applies equally well to open science. And so essentially, if we all put a little bit of investment in time and, and learning how to use these skills, I think we'll be a lot better off in the long run in terms of uh, how we can we can affect change. So I'll close there. Um, now I think I'm gonna hand off to uh, to Julie to uh, actually she'll give some some actual examples of how to do this in practice. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand it over to Julie. Great. Hi everyone. Um, thanks so much, Marcus. That talk was so great. Um, so inspiring to see what you have done at uh, Tampa Bay um, and just how open science is really being used day to day in your work and with with purpose on the ground. It's really exciting. Um, so is every, can someone uh, verbalize that they can see my screen? Just so I yep, make sure. I see it. Great. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. See it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great. OK, well, um, yeah. So. I thought to, you know, we thought to complement um, the great story and examples that Marcus just shared, I would focus um, just briefly on the Ocean Health Index. But then, you know, it's Friday afternoon, we thought we'd leave you with some tips and ideas for you to start bringing this into your own work, um, you know, incrementally as you can. So, you know, with the Ocean Health Index, I think, 
Um, th this is a, a, a project at, N at NCs that I'll mention a little bit more, but um, really the place I like to start is that when we were doing data analysis, it was a pretty lonely experience. Um, data analysis has been kind of something that we pick up on our own. It's been really sad and demoralizing and lonely. And even if you're like the crab <laughs> up in the corner there that you know might be going okay on their own, um, you know, science is not a, a singular activity or an individual activity. So it's it's like a mismatch for data analysis to be so individual. And what we learned with the Ocean Health Index is that there's a whole landscape of open science and open source solutions to our data troubles. And there's pathways that have been created. There's potential for new um, for new exploration in different environments, like in the rowboat out to sea. You know, there's it's this rich place of um, this rich world of open science. And we, with the Ocean Health Index, started to become aware of and included in this environment through some open source communities based in R, which was the language that we decided to, um, to work with. So really our story, our compressed story with the Ocean Health Index is that we found out the hard way that our default approaches for data analysis were not reproducible even by ourselves. So this is a paper that we published in 2017, Our Path to Better Science in Less Time Using Open Data Science Tools. And it shows that um, our whole approach to reproducibility and collaboration enhanced through uh, you know, an, an investment, a substantial investment, um, like Marcus was saying, in open science and open source tools and learning R and learning GitHub together. We, we invested that as a team early on and have seen rewards uh, moving forward in terms of it taking us less time to do our science now and and forever more. So, you know, this, this did require new skill sets and also new mindsets. It's changing the behavior that we had are always taken around data analysis. But we were able to do it because we trusted each other. We we agreed to work like a team and trusted each other like a team, even if we were not working on the same project. And we had leadership that that uh, that encouraged our participation in open science. And through that, we became leaders ourselves and sort of horizontally within teams and beyond. And so the enduring benefits of open science have been far beyond data analysis. It's let us reimagine public engagement and science communication and participate and how how we participate in science. It's um, let us share our code and data and, and thinking about open access publishing, even though our entryway was through analysis. Um, and it's really broadened our idea of collaborators and who we can collaborate with and how we learn. Um, and, and I think, you know, so one take on this is that really open science was a means to meet our analytical needs. It wasn't a philosophy that we we admired and sought to, you know, um, it, it like it benefited us immediately in our work. And it, so we were willing to make the time. And like I said, you know, these open habits that we've developed have reframed our culture and how we do science. And so these are some of the design elements for OpenScapes, which is a program that I run now to help other research groups follow this, this story and reimagine data analysis, develop modern skills that are of immediate value to them and cultivate collaborative and inclusive research communities. So we really think about this as engaging, um, empowering and amplifying each other as we all learn. And so to, to uh, introduce the idea here through um, the idea that OpenScapes is like a park ranger that's there to welcome you into this landscape, um, help you build trails, help you avoid pitfalls, and ultimately have everyone be able to learn together and, and create paths and go forward. So this is, um, yeah, I this is artwork by Allison Horst, and this is one of the first times I'm talking it through, so it's really exciting <laughs> to do this with you. Um, but to make this concrete, uh, there's three things that will change your research life, 
And there are three, they are things that were really important to us with the Ocean Health Index. They are in practice with Tampa Bay Estuary Program, what like Marcus was just saying. And these three things are tidy data, our markdown, and kinder science. So um, tidy data is, is something that might not sound that exciting. <laughs> it's really, when we talk about organizing data, we're talking about working in an efficient and reproducible and collaborative way. And that's what we're talking about when we think about tidy data. It means deliberately thinking about the shape of the data and the structure of the data. And this is something that might not sound that exciting, but is truly game changing. So tidy data is a way to describe um, what's organized with particular, uh, what's, it's, it's a way to describe data that's organized in a particular structure, a rectangular structure. And in that um, format, each variable has its own column and each observation has its own row. So there's only one thing in every cell and it's very strictly organized. And why this is important is um, Hadley Wickham, who is um, a lead of tidy data and um, a, a hero in the R community for creating many data packages um, and, and software analysis packages. He describes tidy data the way Leo Tolstoy describes families. So saying that happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And this is true, I think, of, of data as well. And why it's important to, to have this mindset is because when you're working with tidy data, we can use the same tools in similar ways for different data sets. But when you're working with untidy data, um, it means that you're often reinventing the wheel with one-time approaches that are hard to iterate and reuse. And this means that you're creating these like weird custom analyses for the shape of your data rather than being able to um, take advantage of open source options that are out there. Tidy data is easier for collaboration um, because if other people are using similar tools in familiar ways, then you're able to work more easily together. And this is really important too when we're thinking about collaborators that it's not, um, it's not just other people, it is, well, it is first and foremost yourself in the future. It's future you. How can you work today that is going to help you in a month to come back to this project and understand or next year or beyond? And so thinking about future you and also future us who might be included in this project later um, is a really important way to think about collaborators in addition to all of our friends and collaborators in person and on the internet. Um, tidy data makes it easier for reproducibility and reuse. Um, if each part of your data set, or, or if, you, if each part of your data analysis has the same expectations for the shape of the data that will be inputted and outputted, it can be easier to iterate and rearrange and test and rerun as you go. And so once also, once you um, are empowered with tools to work with data, gen data, with tidy data generally, it opens up a whole new world of data sets where they feel more approachable because you have tools that will let you see potential in data and, and be able to, um, to work more fluently with those data. So this transferable confidence and ability to collaborate is probably the best thing about tidy data. So these are some references um, to help you learn more about tidy data. Um, that that's just a sampling because there's a lot of great resources, but this is a really great start. Um, actually, the, and the second one by uh, Broman and Wu, Data Organization and Spreadsheets, is a fantastic paper, and it's the third most downloaded paper ever from the Journal of Statistical Software. It's behind two papers about p-values and then this paper. So it's a delightful read that I highly recommend. Okay, the second one is R Markdown. So R Markdown is something that takes text and code together and it will knit with a bit of magic, it seems, into beautiful reports. So, the, so our markdown is the engine behind uh, Tampa Bay's report cards that Marcus was describing. This is a way to, for reproducibility and presentation um, to, to really combine. So what our markdown is, is this is a screenshot of a, our markdown file where there is simple text formatting uh, in the white, and then there's our code in the shaded gray. And this means that, um, 
that you know our markdown is powerfully combining executable R code with this simple text formatting so that you can automate these reproducible reports. And something that's really cool is that because your analyses and your figures are in the same place, it will save you time as you iterate your document through in creating a document. You're never going to be copying and pasting a figure into a Word document anymore. You're, that amount of that uh, that will be something that's not no longer in your life. Um, so what our markdown does is from that first image on the left, um, which is the code, that audit, that magic part is when it renders into a familiar document that you might want to use, like a Word document or a PDF. And so this is gets really powerful because you're running your code and you're doing your analyses and you're creating figures. And when you press that knit button to knit the magic, you get these reports that then you can share with colleagues as as um, as you need to. But what is like I think completely game changing about our Markdown too is that it leverages open science and the internet in an incredible way because you can also make an HTML file instead. So when you make an HTML file as easily as you could make a Word file, it opens up the, the opportunity for you to collaborate and distribute and share your work in like an unparalleled way. Through the Ocean Health Index, we started off making single page web pages with our supplemental methods, which is up there on the top left. But very soon we, we made a website where we could share more background about our program. Then we, uh, and that's in the top right. And then in the bottom left, we, um, we actually were able to create a book, an ebook that taught folks how to use the tools we were building for the Ocean Health Index and also onboard to data science and open science to begin with. And then it's been really powerful much beyond there. Um, one example on the bottom right is that we're able to um, spin up websites for our partners that are doing Ocean Health Index assessments around the world. And so there's a, a, you know, a template that's populated and they're able to edit their um, as they want, but this is a communication tool far beyond just us. Um, one final thing I'll say about our markdown is that it, something that's incredible about it is that it doesn't only support the R language. So you can create you can create all of this by using Py by writing in Python in an R Markdown document um, and create the websites and and whatnot like I was just talking about. And something that is just absolutely exciting for collaboration too is that within the same R Markdown document you can have different languages. So this is an example where a Python bit of code is then going to be passed and used and plotted in R in that second chunk. And so this is so exciting for collaborating with folks with different coding backgrounds that would be able to um, be able to uh, contribute together. Um, there's a lot more to say about our markdown, um, but these are some resources that will uh, help you get started if you're interested in, in learning more. Um, and I highly recommend just Googling and there's a lot of great YouTube videos as well. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end with the idea of kinder science. So, Open science is not just about improving the way that we share data and methods. It's about improving the way we think and work and interact with each other. So I've, I've thought about kinder science in the context of how technology and software enables that social infrastructure where then we can be more kind to each other. So the idea that if it's easier to collaborate with each other, um, say in a Google Doc, if you're both able to collaborate together in the same Google Doc, you're able to think together in a way that wasn't possible before if someone was going to be downloading a file and editing it and emailing it back. Like there's there's a, an element where friction, as friction is reduced because of these collaborative and open tools, we're able to rethink our relationships around how, how we work with science. But I think going beyond this, we really need to think about how open science can also help us shift the culture and make science more diverse and equitable and inclusive and just. And so I think, you know, it's, it's upon all of us to think about how our, our de decisions that we make as scientists and our actions that we, that we have how can how can our not only our data workflows but our whole approach to science be more open and empathetic and anti-racist? 
and, and really thinking about how open science is a practice and kinder science is a practice and what can we do every day um, so that we can better, so that we can do better and we can better support others. So I'm learning a lot about this as well. Um, and these are some of the resources that have really helped me um, learn and listen and reflect and hopefully act more and more um, to, to be an uh, ally in this space. So I will, I'll end there um, really with this image again that you know we're all learning together. The, the idea of the, the park ranger here is that there's, there's interaction and play and, and as we learn more together, we can all pass that forward and become rangers in our own ways. So um, thank you again for the chance to talk to all of you and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, yeah, and we're gonna start taking questions. Let's see how I actually do this. There's somebody raising their hand. I'm gonna figure out how to better see this, but if you're raising your hand, just to ask the question. <laughs> Click on the participant I know, I know icon. Usually. Oh, participants, okay, gotcha. Nancy Williams, there we go. Yeah, Not I know in. we usually take students first, so I don't know if you wanna do that or. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, do we have any student questions first? Uh, not yet, so uh, Nancy, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I, I just really, really enjoyed those talks. Um, I especially appreciated the, the learning curve figure because um, I'm a new assistant professor here and I'm switching from MATLAB to Python and um, I really, you know, I'm doing it for all kind of the same reasons that you talked about here, um, but I'm really struggling a little bit with with the practicality of it all. So I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at your um, resources. Um, so I guess I have one question for each of you, actually. Um, my question for Marcus is, um, you know, you mentioned that it was kind of a partnership between um, the scientist, the, you know, the ecological scientist and a data scientist. And so I'm wondering um, where can we find data scientists who are interested in doing this work, um, kind of recognizing that um, honestly, they could probably go and make more money working at like a tech company or something. Um, and, and then my question for Julia, is um i guess you know the reality is that science is competitive and so i've already found myself having to make decisions about um you know what am i going to make public and what am i going to keep private and then when am i going to make that public um is it going to be after i put my preprint online is it going to be after the publication happens and so kind of how do you make those decisions um in your own work thanks yeah, thanks, Nancy. Um, I first have to give credit to uh, the origin of that graphic about the learning curve. That's from uh, Dr. Leah Wasser. She's a GIS expert. Um, when I was first learning these tools, I saw her give a presentation and I was all like, that's exactly how it's like. And so I've been <laughs> using that, that graphic ever since, but uh, it's not an original content on my end, but I think it's a shared experience nonetheless. Um, to your question about where can you find good data scientists, um, that's a hard one to answer because um, you're absolutely right. I think people that tend to have those types of skill sets will tend to migrate towards other fields that are more lucrative, um, which is a kind of unfortunate, but all I can say to that is I, I do see the tide changing in a way. Um, I've been using R for uh, since 2007, and in that time, I've seen these skill sets, these data science skill sets become more and more common among students coming out of natural resource programs. Uh, and so I think people are realizing there's a need for it and they're actually catering towards that need. Um, so I think 
now it's changing. In a couple of years, it'll be a little bit better. And I believe UC Santa Barbara, Julie, you can correct me, but I think they actually, they, were, they just started a environmental data science master's program uh, this last year to sort of fit that role. Um, so it's getting better, um, but it is difficult to, to find somebody who has those skill sets that wants to work in this field. But when you do find that person, hold on to them because they're going to help. Because <laughs> understanding both those sides is a challenge, as you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for the question. Um, I think um, I really think open science is a is a spectrum, and it's something that you you begin to practice. Um, so I. Th with OpenScapes, we really focus on how to be more open within your own team, within your own lab group. Like how can you how can you design shared practices so that it's easier to onboard new students and new um, postdocs into your lab, and also so that less um, is lost as folk, you know, less knowledge and code and data um, ideas are are lost as folks move to other labs. So I think like starting as open you can have a it's very strong to have an open mindset within your team and and it's and then you can be more open publicly when you're ready so like with data and, and whatnot um yeah so i think yeah i'll leave it there thank you cool and we actually do have a student question from b Hi, um, I, I'm, I'm probably going to have so many questions and I honestly can't think of one right now. I'm just really, really excited to hear this presentation and so thankful for it and the work that you guys are both doing. Um, I kind of found myself, I was an ecologist, you know, undergrad biologist, um, and I kind of found myself in GIS and R as like a way to get job security. Um, so I've been working in those things kind of at, like the leading edge of a lot of different um, in endeavors that ended up not always working out um, in contract positions to make our data more accessible and um, more uh, available. And also to, you know, I, I remember distinctively one um, example was when I worked at FWC as a um, OPS contractor and we were trying to develop a website for turtle data for people to collaborate ac across FWC using, um, to show where project gaps 